everybody, and you're very welcome to the latest episode of the South Tip Arts Podcast. Well, Nikailika continues here at South Tip Arts Centre. It opened on May the 7th and it will continue until June the 12th. Nikailika are a collective of eight older women, all based in Ireland, but coming from the Netherlands, England, Switzerland, as well as Ireland, six artists, one musician and an art writer, bent on exploring ways of working together. This exhibition is the first ever showing of work from the collective and is the result of a month-long residency that they undertook together at the Ballanglen Arts Foundation last September. In the last episode, you heard from half of the Kalika and in this episode, we will be hearing from the other four members. Just a reminder that South Tip Arts Centre will also host a one-day symposium this coming Saturday, the 29th of May, The Age of Reason and Unreason. The gallery will be closed on Saturday to the public to facilitate the filming. It will feature guest speakers, Professor Roseanne Kenny, poet Grace Wells and theatre producer Maeve Lambert, as well as contributions from most of Nikailika themselves. No booking is required for the event and it will be live streamed via our website. If you'd like to have a look at the full schedule, you can visit our website at www.southtipartcentre.ie or you can have a look at our social media where you'll also find the lineup. First up in this episode is Patricia Hurl. Originally from Dublin, she now lives and works in County Offaly. Her work is of a political nature, drawing her influences from the feminist artists and activists of the 60s, 70s and 80s. Originally a painter, in the last few years she has begun to collaborate with artist filmmaker Terry Rudin. Their practice has developed into performance and film work which has helped to sustain them during COVID-19 as they return to working on their ongoing body of performance and video and text work on the subject of folk narrative. Patricia is responsible for the series of portraits of Nikailika that are currently on display in the gallery here and you can also see them on our social media as we've been featuring them over the last number of weeks. I was delighted to catch up with Patricia to have a chat about how her experience in Ballinglen affected her and her work. Patricia, thanks a million. I've been talking to each of the women in turn. Thanks so much for taking some time out to have a chat with me. Really, what I've been talking to everyone about is what what I take away from looking at the exhibition and listening to you all talking is is the kind of the sense of energy that it's sort of given you, not that you didn't have energy in your work, but I imagine it's energized your practice in loads of different ways. And like you've all seemed to be really busy since, you know, the Kyleka project. And it seems to have blossomed uh-huh. into something uh-huh. huger altogether than you had even intended. Absolutely. It's, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's been um Life-changing for us, in fact. I think the lockdown was particularly, well, it's hard for everybody. It's mm. really hard for everybody. So I'm only just saying that it's particularly hard for performers, artists, you know, people that need the public to see their work and to, to have an intercourse with the, with the world. So mm-hmm. it, that was, and we also, well, age plays a big role in that too, because we are less likely to be working. You know, you don't you don't get the opportunities that young people coming out of college get. And I taught in an art college myself, so I know what I'm talking about. I know how important it is for young people to get uh, platforms and not just see the same old, same old faces in the art scene. So I totally understand that. But having said that, there doesn't seem to be an alternative venues for older people that we can continue to feel engaged we'll always do art it's never going to stop us doing art but to actually feel engaged with the world and engaged with uh, contemporary art and the contemporary art scene and especially well we live in the country and I retired to the country Mm. thinking it would be brilliant because having a life of teaching I was always doing my work and showing but it was very exhausting and I thought I'll go to uh, open up a studio in the country and (laughs) do lots of art and wonderful things and sure I it was difficult very difficult we didn't even get we couldn't find any artists around us it's very hard to advertise any artists out there yeah. Lovely people, lovely people around me, but you need your own your own clan 
as well. Yeah, you really do. Yeah. Well, you know, having the, the exhibition has been open here now for a couple of weeks. And um, one thing that I've really noticed is the demographic of the visitors. Is yes. The older, which you love to hear. And mm-hmm. I really do believe that there are people coming in to see this exhibition that maybe wouldn't on a normal day, you know, um, oh, that have seen brilliant. you on the news or in the papers or whatever. And have just gone, wow, I have to see this. That's so nice to hear. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I mean, in a way, when you're in the city, I was in Temple Bar Gallery. It was Mm. my studio place. And you actually could put up a show and very few people would come in. In a big, big two million people city, you'd have very few people come in. And also, I think people are really excited in general, just that they can go back into an art gallery, visit an exhibition again. Yes. And really yeah. get a sense of that. And it's brilliant. So, yeah, um, yeah. Just in terms of your work, something I've just, I don't know if it's right, the right thing to say, but is it fair to say that um, your portraits I've been kind of featuring, um, I'll be featuring this week, each of your portraits in turn, just as a little profile of each of the members of the group in the run up to the symposium lovely. on Saturday. But um is it fair to say that because you, you're very multidisciplinary in your work, did you kind of rediscover painting a little bit on your trip to Ballinglen? Again, again. Yeah, I I went, I had a very bad fall. Mm. Well, I was getting arthritis anyway. That's my, my only problem is arthritis, which is really nothing I can, painkillers mm. can deal with. It, so I'm very, very lucky. Mm. But I had a bad fall in the early stage of the lockdown. Yeah. And I just couldn't paint. I couldn't use my hands. And it was a long, a la, very long recovery time. Mm. I was in, you know, I, I had a cast and stuff like that. It was my right hand. So I, yeah. I tried using my left hand. But the really interesting thing about being in the Kylie, this is really hard to believe. I started to make soft sculpture instead of using pens and pencils and all the stuff I had to use. And the soft sculpture, I was making these giant dolls just for fun. And they started to take a life of their own. I, I mean, I actually, it was my own, um, I lay down and Terry drew around me. So they were actually yeah. my size. So yeah. they're big, <laughs> they're big. So this was exciting. So I'd started that before, before I joined Nick and mm. And, and then when I, when we got together in, in Ballon Glen last year, I brought my paints I just decided, oh, sure, I'll bring watercolors, and I then I threw in a few more paints just to be um, to be sure. Yeah. And I went down, and we met up, and saw old friends. Most of us, as only one person in the group I didn't meet before, hmm. we're all old friends. Had gone to college together, or had oh, practiced yeah. together way yeah. back in the seventies and eighties. Hmm. So um, meeting old friends was just brilliant and seeing them getting old and seeing me getting old. And yeah. it was just it was lovely, lovely, staying as beautiful as they ever were, mind yeah. you. And uh, we were all deciding what we do. And I had been given a very lonely studio. The rest of them were lucky. They were in a, a, a combined space right. out in the barn. But I was given this studio with no windows. Oh, it yeah. had, had roof windows. <laughs> So it was like stepping into my brain every day. I was going in there with nowhere else to go but inside. Yeah. And I found it incredibly lonely. And especially because I'm saying before, we live very remote in, in, in the Schlieblum Mountains. Yeah. And uh, so one time over one of the meals, I suggested, well, maybe I'll draw one of you. Would you, would you mind giving, sharing one? It's part, like their time is very precious. We don't have a great deal of energy and the energy has to be spent on our own art. Yeah. So I felt very bad asking them, would yeah. they mind sitting? And I was amazed. I'm going to cry now. <laughs> you won't see me cry. <laughs> but I was amazed how generous they were with their time. Oh. They had to give up their time in their studio to come and sit for me. And so I was driven by that. That drove me. That This wasn't something I'm good at. I'm not, never, I'm not a portrait painter at all, at all, at all. Yeah. And it wouldn't be what I'd say. I would be in my CVs or anything like that. Yeah. But I often paint people I love just because I love them. Yeah. You know, my grandchildren and my children. And yeah. I do lots of self-portraits because I'm there, sick of myself. But they came and they sat. And I imagine some interesting conversations were had in those sittings. Oh, it was wonderful. And and I always think, I know from from experience that people who sit for you, if the atmosphere is right, they come out saying, I really enjoyed that. 
Yeah. And it's difficult. It's difficult for to have somebody stare at you and stare it's at you. It's an intimate you. thing, isn't it? It's yeah. such an intimate thing. Yeah. I. It's such an intimate It's literally like touching you. Really, it yeah. is. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of electric between the sitter. It's, it's, I've said to everybody, I don't see it as my project at all. Yeah. And I make, make that clear to you now. This yeah. was a collaboration yeah. and it would not have happened without their generosity and the fun we had and their forgiveness we had because I was <laughs> in the early stages. They were like Dracula and his, his, his comrades. But, you know, I, I had to go home without them. Yeah. And then uh, I was trying to use my memory because I did take photographs, but I didn't take photographs myself. But Terry had taken lots of photographs. Mm. So I was looking at different angles and none of them really suited what I was doing. Yeah. So. I didn't, I didn't have a great time. I really struggled towards the end. And yeah. by the end of it, I was sweating blood. And so they'll tell you on the opening night, I was dreading it because I thought it was a load of rubbish on the wall. I couldn't see them anymore. Oh, wow. You just got and they weren't, they weren't moving for me. You know, I'm normally much looser with paint. And if somebody's in front of me talking to me, I don't see their closed mouth. I can get a moving mouth. It's very encouraging to actually hear somebody with a career like yours have the doubts, you know. Oh, my God, I have doubts every day. I have doubts every day. The only doubt I have, the only doubt I haven't got is that I'm doing what I was born to do. And uh, I have been doing it since I was a, a baby. And I, uh, I want to say here too, because I'm talking to all of us older people out there that might be listening. Mm. You're never too old to take it up. And if you were doing it when you were a child and you were not that anybody thought it was good, it's nothing to do with anybody else. Yeah. But if you loved what you were doing, yeah. then do it again. Do it again. Get yeah. yourself some pencils, uh, soft pencils. Don't go harder than a HB, go soft, get a six yeah. B, think of the Bs, black, yeah. go six black, seven black, four black, five black, three black, all the blacks yeah. and a paper and just draw, just have fun because everybody can draw. It's a, it's a voice, it's your voice, it's, a, it's, a, it's another language and it's competition stops it, as you all know, I'm pre- preaching now, but it's knocked out of kids. It is. It and is somebody it is. else comes along who's much better. Yes. And, and there's no such thing as better. It's only different. Yeah. You're different. different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you get older, and my, my hand, I didn't even notice I had a bad hand. Mm. I'd notice afterwards, I'd be taking my paracetamol. Yeah. But while I'm doing it, I had no pain. I could stand all day and not know that I'm standing. And it's, you're, going out of your, your, uh, you're going out of your senses. You're going out yeah. of your sensible you into yeah. another realm. And people say that about dancers. How can they keep dancing the way they do? Mm. How do they dance into their 70s? Because when you're doing it, you're using some other part of you that doesn't feel anything else. That you're really going into an intensity. Yeah. And I've seen that. I worked with did um, women's studies through art in the DIT, and I worked with the local community in Portland Road. Mm. And they had a lot of them had left school at fourteen to mind the children. They were all my age. You know, yeah. they're all now. They were all sixties, seventies. And um, I got in a woman, I can't remember her name, but she was a she was a stage designer and she loved working with people who didn't know how to draw. And she said, I can teach anyone how to draw. And she had them drawing. She had them drawing. She had them looking at shapes and just draw that shape for me and draw that shape for me. And they loved it. Yeah. I think it's think it's more, if you lose your voice, if people are horrible to you, if you've had a really bad day, if you're feeling old and forgotten and voiceless, that's the biggest thing. Voiceless. We we are voiceless often. People walk past me at the when I go up to the countertop to serve somebody, generally a big man behind me. But if you have that happen to you and you go home and pick up your drawing and you draw devils. You draw a scream. Yeah. You just scribble. I swear it it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be yeah. really, really, really wonderful for you. 
Do you know what? That's great advice to leave it on, Patricia. Okay. <laughs> Everybody. Okay. Uh, I am sure. It's lovely to talk to you and it's lovely. And I'm delighted they're coming in to see the pictures. They can do that themselves eventually if they work hard enough at it. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for your time, Patricia. Take care. And, um, Take care. Bye-bye. 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 Artist Barbara Freeman is the oldest member of Nikolika Collective and in her long and illustrious career she has taken part in over 40 solo exhibitions of paintings, prints and installation works all over the world. Barbara has embraced fully the digital technology in her work and though she's mainly known as a painter and printmaker she has more recently been involved in all sorts of collaborative ventures oftentimes with composers and musicians because of how contemporary composition offers a huge resource of processes and structures that can be paralleled through the visual arts. I caught up with Barbara for a quick chat to hear about her experiences at Ballon Glen and her collaborative process with jazz musician Carol Nelson during this time. Barbara, yes. it's absolutely wonderful to have you on the podcast um, this week. You're the final of the Kailaka on my list. So it's absolutely brilliant to have the full compliment now uh, in my back pocket. I've spoken to all of you. So um, oh, that's nice. You've got a very diverse range of styles in your work, so you you kind of multidisciplinary what you do. Yes. How did you find the process um, of working within the collective, and did you find that challenging? Or you know, are you into kind of collaborating generally, or was it kind of a new experience? Well, I have co- collaborated quite a lot with composers and musicians mm. making like installations about places, um, usually in galleries, but I've worked with the Effie McWilliam Gallery and the the Mac. Um, mm-hmm. But this is only my thir- third video. Yeah. And uh, I feel quite kind of green when I do it. As if, <laughs> you know, I just discover things as I go along. That's a nice way to work, though, Barbara, you know. And also then, if if, you, if I feel sometimes if you know too much, it's almost um, to the detriment because you feel like you need to follow certain rules or... You yes. Know, to <laughs> no, I'm too old for that, though. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's good to not know and to just play like that or experiment yeah. and see what comes yes. out of it. Yes. Yeah. So, so when, 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 when we all arrived at the residency at Ballingen, I had no idea what I would do, mm. absolutely none. I only knew two of the other artists. Yeah. I'd only known them before. So every, most people were new to me. And after the first few days, mm. I realised how different we were as artists, but how similar a lot of our life experiences were. I know most of us had children, you know, uh, brought them up, tried tried to keep a career going while bringing up children. And some lost partners like myself along the way. So our life experiences were quite similar, but our work was quite different. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You're all even like as you're all such different characters and I found speaking to everybody, you're all quite strong characters uh, and very different from each other, but somehow that sort of spectrum of personalities and it just seems to, I think maybe because as a collective then, like no matter who you're um, talking to, everybody will identify with at least one of you, you know? Yes, yes. Well, I think we all identified in the end to one another. And that, and I think that's how a group really must work. Yeah. Um, but uh, going back to what, how I started making a video, I, I, at first, after a few days, I thought, well, I would make images of each of the participants just with a single still as a, like, portrait. But And I, I would ask them to say something, but it would be such... Not so much incidental things, but, you know, very short little things that uh, yeah. I could use to, to get the sound of their voice. Mm. And then I would use these to interrupt a flow of the images which, is, which are really made up. 
of you know images, videos of the landscape there and the stones, Beautiful. the rock surfaces, yeah, yeah. and then the, the actual skin mm. and hands are, are of the artists themselves. And I would kind of make this as a, like a continuum. Mm. But when I got home and started to work on the idea, mm. the idea that they would become individual portraits was just just developing without me noticing it, as it were. Uh, and uh, in the end, I had the dilemma, of, am I going to keep them as these individual little voices of each character or whether I would, uh, again, mix it all up and have a kind of, just a kind of continuum of sound. And I decided to keep them as portraits. Yeah. And then, of course, I had Carol's music and then I had to match the music almost to like to the feel of the person. But at the same time, I didn't want to use any images of the work or of them working, but I wanted to find a kind of metaphor for what I feel they were as artists as, and as people. Oh yeah, that's fantastic! And you really succeeded in that. It's a oh, it's good, a, yeah, it's a powerfully yeah. lovely piece. Actually, people are really responding well to it when they come in here. Oh, please um, about that. Yes. Mm. Now I know that you've not been too well, so I hope that you're feeling good at the moment. Um, I'm feeling fine. I'm I'm waiting for a knee operation. That's one of my problems, so I can't walk very far. Okay, yeah, yeah. What I did know was um, from talking to everybody was that. Just being part of the project and spending the months together and everything seems to have like forged some very deep bonds for one thing between you. Yes, all. I think it has. Yes, yeah, yeah. definitely. It's definitely it has. Yes. Yeah. And, and that thing about sort of strength in numbers and that your voice becomes louder when there are more of you and that seems to be very, very true. It, well, in terms of if you even look at the coverage from the media that you've you've got for this project, then I mean, yes, and all the invitations for more shows that we seem to be having. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that it seems to have like sort of re sparked something or put you all going in different directions, exploring things that you maybe had moved away from. Um, like yeah. the way Patricia kind of found herself being drawn back towards the painting. Well, I, I, I mostly I have been a painter over the years, but. Uh, I I got interested in digital print quite accidentally. First, because I was sick of asking my husband to type letters for me. So I bought a computer, so I did my own typing. <laughs> and and then after after that I began to look at Photoshop and play around with imagery. Yes. There's something really nice about collaborating with people. Because actually it takes you somewhere where you wouldn't otherwise go in terms of the, the, the kind of creative expressions you do. And I kind of rather like that because it, 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 it's a way in which you surprise yourself with what you're doing because you have this contact and this relationship with somebody else. Yeah. And, and it's not always determined by me and I, I think that's that gives you a kind of freedom because you know as you get older mm. <laughs> over 80 as it were you really don't want to you know get set in your ways as an artist yeah and that's collaborating so one of these things that will take you outside of your comfort zone exactly exactly in terms of you mentioned that um you've all seem to be your diaries appear to be filling up with shows as that's happened for you too presumably and you've, you've all of a sudden found yourself that you're going to be very busy for you know the next yes year too <laughs> um, yes. How, is that fabulous like how does that sit with you oh it, it sits with me very well mm. uh, I mean I had just finished a show at the Fenderesque Gallery uh, before we met up in Bally Glen. Mm. And I hadn't any plans for the next project. So this was wonderful for me. I mean, I just kind of went into it, you know. That's brilliant. Um, in terms of Saturday, you won't be able to join us for the symposium. You're so well, I'm going to be online, so I, c- I could be on Zoom. 
So you're going to be joining us live in the for the panel discussions and stuff. That'll be six. Yes, I am. Yes. So it's going to be a great day, and um, it'll be wonderful to see you then and to get your contributions on the day. Thank you so much for taking some time out to have a chat with me. Barbara, I'm going to let you go. It's been lovely. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, good luck. And I shall hear from you on Saturday. Lovely. We'll see you then. And thanks for your time. Carol Nelson is the baby of the group, as well as being the only musician in the collective. She is a jazz composer, a multi-instrumentalist, as well as a teacher. Carol is currently in the middle of recording her latest album with her Carol Nelson trio and I was delighted that she was able to take a few minutes out of her very busy schedule to have a chat with me about Nakailika and her experiences during the residency in Ballon Glen. You're madly busy at the moment. I know, I know. It was so much going on with Nakailika and I've also got the um got a, a new trio album, you know, jazz album to, and we're recording this weekend. So everything's kind of collided. Building up now to your symposium next Saturday. Yeah, yeah. so unfortunately I can't be there because it's I'm recording at the weekend. Well, look, it'll all be available for you to join in with later. And I'm sure this is really only the beginning for you anyway, as we've kind of been talking about with the, with the others over the last couple of weeks. And the, the one thing I really take from it, I have a real sense that the collective has like energised all of you in similar ways, maybe. Yes. Yes, it has. I think we're, and and you know, one of the um, unforeseen good consequences of COVID has been our weekly Zoom meeting, which okay. has held us together in a way that I don't think it would have happened like that if we, because we're so spread out physically. You know, we might not have thought to have brought something like that into being. And and uh, and actually, every Sunday we just love our Zoom meeting because we've all become really close friends. And that feeling of support and the energy that it generates for us individually and as a collective is is massive. That's fantastic. In terms of how did you get involved, Carol, at the very beginning of the project? Like, where did, who was your connection? Did you know some of the other women involved? I didn't know any of the women involved, but a very good friend of mine, Cormac Larkin, who is um, a jazz musician and a writer, and he's my neighbour, he lives very close. He kind of grew up knowing Patricia and Terry. Yeah. Patricia in particular, who's the mother of his best friend, lifelong friend. So mm-hmm. Patricia had asked him, do you know any musicians he suggested me and even though I I mean they were looking for somebody over 70 and I'm not I'm only 60 how old am I 65 <laughs> it's great when you can't remember I love it I, know, I love it I just love it. I'm sure as I get to the end of my life I'll be going if I get as far as that I'll be going I'm, a, I'm 89 and a half <laughs> so yeah they just kind of checked me out and thought okay we'll have her I was thrilled because I guess I mean we were just going into when was it? it we'd gone into lockdown I think already mm-hmm. so it just opened things up instead of closing things down because I, I you know I no longer had any gigs like all musicians we've really um, <laughs> we haven't been able to work or we, we've got very good at applying for grants. <laughs> yeah. That's a rare challenge. Yeah, so that's how it came about. So the first time I met everybody, we had a. At a lunch during the summer last year in at Helen's place and I met everybody for the first time and that took it from there so I went to Ballin Glen with a very open feeling of well I don't know what it's going to be like and mm-hmm. it was just brilliant. And did you find that um, working with this kind of group of visual artists was something different for you and that it made you approach the music differently? It gave me a lot to think about uh, in terms of, I, I, I looked for things that we shared, uh, you know, in terms of creativity. So I remember writing down words and concepts like space, emptiness, energy, dynamism, uh, you know, storyline, yeah. landscape, just as kind of all these uh, ideas, really. Mm. And we talked about those kind of things. So it was very kind of reaching across the different art art endeavours. Now, Carol, to be honest, I know nothing really about jazz. I, d- I found myself in a, in a kind of a late night jazz club in Edinburgh a couple of years ago, uh, probably one of the last times I've been away anywhere at this point. But um, I was absolutely blown away by the, the energy of it and the yes. amount of people on the stage um, they spread across all ages. It was so impressive. And I thought, 
wow, well, like, I'd actually like to know more about this. And I think um, it, just from my point of view, jazz has that can be more abstract. It has yes. that space in it to be more abstract that other maybe genres don't have. Well, I, I, I'll talk about it. it. It's a very broad church. So you might find someone saying, oh, I hate jazz because they've heard a particular thing or I love it because they've heard a particular, but it's huge. So I think the, um, the commonality is, is, is improvisation. Yeah, yeah, that there seemed to be so much of that going on, which is it's so in the moment and kind of um, spontaneous and lovely, you know. I mean, it's just so freeing when you're in it and doing it. But I mean, that, that saying improvisation, that can range from something that we'd call free, completely free with no discussion, no concept, nothing, just mm-hmm. sound and entering into that space to a much more constructed, composed piece that allows space for improvisation. Mm. And what I'm doing, I mean, you talked about seeing lots and lots of people on stage, which is so thrilling and exciting. Mm. I've I've stripped things down at the moment to a piano, um, which I play, and uh, a bass and drums. Uh, I work with a a regular rhythm section, Cormac O'Brien and Dominic Mullen. So we're about to do our third album in this kind of genre, which is, it's not so much the swing, which is just, you know, yeah. lovely. Uh, a, a lot of contemporary jazz now, we've all grown up with that, but we've kind mm-hmm. of into a, I suppose it's a more European sensibility than, than American. Yeah. Kind of closer, yeah. To, uh, closer to a European influence from people like, I don't know, Debussy, going back to Impressionism. Um, yeah, you know, I, we've been living with your piece in the gallery, just it's on a loop in the background all day long, actually. Um, and it's really, it's not every piece of music that you could actually cope with listening to all day long on a loop. But I think because it is abstract and because it's sparse and there is, it's just, it's made me think several different things while listening to the same piece of music dependent on the day and dependent on what my mood is. Um, yeah. And that, I think, is really special. Well, that was that came about through a very different process because while I was in Ballinglen and Barbara Freeman was working on her, her film, which I think is absolutely gorgeous, mm. um, and I said, look, I can just play some things and record them and you can take them away and you can do whatever you like with them for the soundscape. So I just sat at the piano, didn't think about it too hard, but I knew that Barbara would, res- you know, I didn't want to do anything too lyrical, too definite, mm-hmm. and kept it very, very abstract and somewhat atonal. Do you know what I mean? Like you can't really pick up on a, a melodic line anywhere. Um, yeah, there's there's an awful lot of emotion in it or something, though. Um, yeah. In it. You know, it's like the the notes you've chosen, they hit straight in there. Wow, that's that's great. I don't really know what I was doing. The only time I actually knew what I was doing was there's a section in her film that she was having difficulty thinking about the music for. This was after it had been in Bowen Glen, and I was only a very short time ago, and this was the piece she did around Herda. And yeah. so I said, well, look, let me just sit at the piano and I'll record a couple of things on that. And I was thinking about Herda, who has this kind of spacious, zen-like quality to her and to her work. Mm. So that kind of then fed into the uh, to the sound. But Barbara, you know, it was a collaboration because Barbara just took what I gave her. And uh, yeah, the visuals are stunning. Yeah. yeah. Well, in terms of the soundtrack as well, just mm. and put in a few other sounds that and uh, yeah, so she had a good time I think playing with what what I gave but I wasn't making creative decisions beyond was that something different for you now have you ever collaborated with anybody like that with visuals and no absolutely not and and in a way I mean my my contribution was kind of like just done so fast and then it was Barbara did all the work of sifting through and choosing Mm -hmm. and and matching it with what she was doing visually it's really beautiful um, Carol, I promised you I wasn't going to keep you very long because I know you were super busy. That's <laughs> fine for you, we can finish. <laughs> Thanks so much for spending a few minutes with me. We are loving the show and we're um, looking forward to Saturday and to the symposium and hopefully you get to tune in at some point in the few days. Won't actually during the day, but if it's available for me in any way afterwards, I, Absolutely, I will. it will be available, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's okay. available on our, on our shiny new website where everything, <laughs> we have a house oh, for everything now. It really looks great. I've been sending it 
people and putting it on Facebook and hopefully people have been taking that little online tour. Yeah, that's a new uh, that's a new departure for us. But I think it's been really successful. And I think going forward, these things will just have to be there as a standard now, because you know what? It's not everybody can make it. And some people aren't well and they, they don't have maybe they have mobility issues or whatever. Just really, you're absolutely right. It's really it's kind of stretched open all kinds of possibilities. You know, even if we we're going to go back to uh, inverted commas normal, these new technologies are just just make all sorts of things available for people. As you it's said. amazing. And I think maybe in some ways we all needed that little push to kind of embrace them fully like lots of us are so resistant exactly like i'm teaching a few people on zoom and uh you know they don't have to travel to where i live in the depths of the country they can yeah. just there's a freedom and there's a great freedom in it yeah carol thanks so much best to look with all your recording and everything and um, we look forward to talking thank to you soon. thank you Emma, and talk to you soon and last but not least in our feature on nicolica is Catherine marshall art historian and writer and curator of The Collective. Catherine felt a little like the odd man out not being an artist and joked that the other members had hoped to pull an artist out from within her somewhere, but it didn't happen. But her contribution as curator and project coordinator has been arguably one of the most important roles in the group. I was delighted to catch up with the woman herself to have a chat about how life has been since Nikolika got together and also the future of the group going forward. Thanks a million for having a chat with me. It's lovely to actually get the full compliment of you all now between the two podcasts. So I've been talking to you all individually about um, your experience of the residency and everything that's come out of it since then. And I think what I've most noticed is that... um, it seems to have affected all of you really profoundly and and seems to have really a, a big influence on, on all of your individual practices as well as your collective. What's your personal experience of the whole thing being? I, I'm the odd one out as you, well, Carol might describe herself as an odd one out because she's a musician and everybody else is into the visual arts. Yeah. But I don't see myself as an artist. And actually when... Patricia and Terry and Helen asked me to join them in the beginning. They were thinking that, you know, there's an artist lurking inside me that's going to come out and we'll all make art together. And and to some extent that was true. But more particularly, I saw myself as drawing together all the strands that were really significant in this group and, you know, just getting us all to look at them and ex- see what we thought of them. So I suppose I was really a bit like the mirror that plays it back to you, to everyone. Yeah, or maybe, you know, you could be maybe described as the kind of linchpin of the thing then. That kind of, because they all talked about really nicely about the conversations, you know, that you, you came up with something to talk about every night that they were there. And I'd say without maybe that little bit of direction, the conversations mightn't have been so productive, maybe perhaps, you know, without a theme to go on every night really seems to have focused everybody you yeah know. including me actually because what it wasn't like people having friends having dinner together and then falling into conversation in different groups around the table it did actually become a focused discussion for at least an hour every night and I did a little bit of um, preparation for it mm. so we were talking about mortality or fear or loneliness or something like that yeah. I would actually, you know, bring a few things, pointers to keep the conversation going, look at different aspects of it. And they and the, they were absolutely, in a way, dying to be drawn out on subjects like that. So maybe what we discovered in ourselves was that these are really important things for us to talk about. And up to now, we maybe had only done, done that with one or two very intimate friends, if we had done it at all or only done it with ourselves. Mm. But it became something that we all did collectively around the table. And what I loved was the way everybody listened to everybody else. You know, there was a great sense of everybody's opinion was valued and respected. Everybody's voice was important. Yeah. 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 And that was lovely because, you know, we've all probably said this, we didn't all know each other to begin with. And when we did first meet we probably weren't even sure that you know that we wanted to go follow certain routes that the group might have gone in but without Mm. ever articulating any of that we just found ourselves coming together around all of those the themes that we talked about 
Yeah. You must have found that um, certain topics and even certain opinions that you would have had personally or each of you would have had personally or maybe maybe things that you you maybe felt that nobody else felt that way or, you know, that uh, and you probably discovered the kind of commonalities of everybody's experience was probably a lot greater than maybe you could have anticipated in the beginning. Maybe, maybe. I know that, for instance, some of us would be very strong feminists. Yeah. Not everybody was. Some people, some people had maybe more commercial approaches to art making than others. Mm -hmm. Some people were more interested in, Art as a something that is a vehicle for social change, as well as, you know, the art they made, they wanted it also to have an impact on society in some way and not just be a beautiful thing. So there were quite serious differences of, of opinion, I think, and in, maybe not opinion, differences of approach yeah. among the group. But when we got talking about those set themes, the themes and things that we talked about or those topics mm. were actually where we found the common ground, you know, and that was very interesting. And even then, it wasn't all about everybody agreeing at all, but it was about us all agreeing that things that we might have rejected out of hand in a different context, we listened to with respect. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's important too, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, Uh, and surprised us all probably. I don't know, it surprised me. Um, But the thing that surprised me most of all was just the support and support and friendship that every single one of the group was prepared to offer to every other person. And, you know, it seems like some really strong bonds now have been formed with you all and that this is, like I've heard it said, by that this is probably just the beginning. Yeah. In many ways, which is a lovely thing to be able to say. Now, I'm also aware, you know, in Ireland, there's a Brendan Behan said about the Irish, um, when they set up any kind of group, the first thing they do is have a split. <laughs> So we're, I was saying to one or two of the others recently, we're about due for the split to reveal itself. <laughs> so we're anticipating the things that might, you know, build up and cause people to feel a bit resentful or something. Yeah, so what yeah. we're doing now is we are going to take those very things and start off our next residency together, which starts in um, the middle of June. And we're going to put those on the table as the, the first thing we'll talk about, you know. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, that's a really yeah. good idea. Well, the exhibition has been up and running here for um, two weeks now, and it's great. And we're looking forward now to Saturday, this Saturday, the 29th, we will have the live symposium streamed here from the gallery. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what we can expect from that day? Okay. Well, we're going to, one of the things that drove us from the very beginning was the fact that we were all over 70. You know, there was a, Mm -hmm. except for one person who's 65, but our plan was that we would gather together a bunch of women Mm -hmm. age 70 or over. So aging was always going to be one of the issues. And of course, what's the aging about? It's about, well, losing some of the agility that you had, maybe losing some of your mental faculties a bit, losing memory, developing health problems Mm -hmm. of different kinds Mm -hmm. and so on. It's a time when people begin to think of themselves as losing rather than gaining. And we wanted to talk about that. I wanted us to talk about that. And everybody was happy to go along with it. So we discovered actually, after a little while, that we were we came out with more gains than losses as we got older. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have on at the symposium on Saturday, we're going to have somebody to talk about health issues and older people and healthy aging mm. and how much group dynamics really can impact on that. That'll be Professor Roseanne Kenny from the uh, Trinity School of Geriatrics. Yeah. And we have Grace Wells, who's well known in the Clonmela area as yeah. a poet and writer, mm-hmm. talking about the place of women in literature and mythology, the place of older women, the crones, hag, really witches. Very interesting, yeah. 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 Then we're going to, after lunch, we're going to um, show the documentary film that Terry Rudin made of us and our practice in yeah. Ballon Glen. And then we'll have a panel discussion with six or so of the of the group will be there. And we'll finish up with Maeve Lambert, who's a young, much younger woman, a theatre director and mm-hmm. producer, offering a, young, a younger woman's response to all the work that we've been doing oh that's fantastic yeah it's going to be a great day Catherine it's going to be a really good day and and a new departure for us here as well to actually do something quite ambitious I think (laughs) yeah (laughs) for his technical abilities 
I'm impressed by Stack's ambitions and by the, the distance that Stack has travelled in recent years. It's been a great achievement. It's yeah. great. It's very exciting times here, I have to say. And uh, no small part thanks to yourself for that, for um, your energy and your all your help and everything. It's, it's really much appreciated by all of us. Thank you. But as you mentioned, me and my energy, mm-hmm. I think one of the things that surprised all of us when we went to Ballon Glen was how much doing things that made us feel good generated energy so nobody came away feeling tired or spun out or I think they were just raring to go and get get back into action you know yeah actually Patricia spoke about how when it kind of ended and she went home how much she missed everybody and even finishing the work and that she had started up there without the group which was interesting like it obviously the energy of each other obviously really fed you as you went through the process. It did seem like that yeah and I know that Gerda said in the documentary film that she was afraid of going home because she was afraid she would you know miss the group dynamic as well I suppose but anyway she survived well and is doing great stuff still <laughs> looking forward to coming back. Catherine thanks a million I'm not going to keep you any longer and let you go now thanks for taking the time out to have a chat with me and the best of luck to you on all your projects going forward (laughs) you're really busy (laughs) thanks Emer. it's great to work with you thanks again talk to you soon and that's it for another episode of the South Tip Arts Podcast. I really hope you enjoyed this a two-part profile of the members of Nikailika. If you'd like to listen to the previous episode or indeed any of the previous episodes, you can now listen directly through our website at www.southtipartcentre.ie where you will also find all the details of current and future exhibitions. Another reminder that the Nikailika Symposium, The Age of Reason and Unreason, will be live streamed from Stack on Saturday, May the 29th, and will include guest speaker Dr. Roseanne Kenny, who's Professor of Medical Gerontology at Trinity College. Nikailika members will also feature, and we will have poet Grace Wells and theatre producer Maeve Lambert also making contributions on the day. Again, you can visit the website www.southtipartcentre.ie to see the full line up for the day. Booking is not essential. It'll be live streamed through the website and through our YouTube channel. If you'd like to get in touch with the podcast, the email address is southtipartspodcast at gmail.com and we'd love to hear from you and we'll talk to you all next time. Mm-hmm.